and Roger, we're live. We are live. Hey, everybody. Welcome to episode one half. Point five. Point five of the Gurus of Gaming podcast. My name is Roger Harper. I am the host and moderator of the Gurus of Gaming podcast. Joining me for episode point five, we have one of our rotating panelists, Mr. Michael Bonner. Oh, it is so good to be here. Uh, I love it here. It's good to be here. Uh, thank you, Michael, for uh, for helping set all this up. For those of you who aren't familiar with Michael, Michael is the CEO, as I'm going to call him, of 13 Palm Trees Podcast Productions. That is our parent production company. And Michael, why don't you tell us a bit about 13 Palm Trees before we get started? So 13 Palm Trees for me actually started as a passion project where we got together and we were playing D&D with a couple of our friends and uh, actually everyone but one of the guys actually that's in the D&D kind of podcast. And when we got together to play, uh, we loved the idea so much that we were like, hey, let's turn this D&D campaign into a podcast. So once we got started, uh, we did one episode. We were super pumped about it, and then we just had started having all these other ideas, and um, wasn't it was never about the money. We really don't make any money. It's really, lo- really, uh, what's the word for it? Low, uh, low profit. So, but it's not. It really is not about making money. It's about getting people involved in something that's a lot of fun and getting to share that content with everyone else. And you know, I, I can definitely echo that because Guru's Gaming for me, it is a passion project. Exactly. I'm not here to make money necessarily. I mean, it would be nice, but let's be honest here. I have a full-time job. I work full-time as a high school teacher. You have a full-time job, and you run this company. Yeah, at kids, um, and exactly. that job requires yeah, you're, 50 you're hours gonna, You're going to be a dad me. here probably in like three days. Yeah, a def- at least three days. From the, from the moment in time we're recording this episode, in 48 hours, the doctors have said, we are inducing for labor, so... So by the time you all are listening to this, which I hope to uh, have out in your in your hands to listen to very soon, Michael is going to be holding a baby with a complete lack of sleep and uh, possibly contemplating a uh, vasectomy. That's, that could be going through his mind. And or suicide. And yeah. or suicide. But let's hope that the last part <laughs> isn't quite as possible as the first part. And uh, he's also the host. Uh, he mentioned the D&D. He is the host of D&D Kinda, which is on iTunes. I highly recommend it. He wrote a, a D&D campaign basically from scratch. And the prologue, is that correct? The prologue for the uh, the campaign is available on iTunes. Yes, sir. It's the, the prologue, uh, we actually had recorded our first session for D&D Kinda. And instead of just releasing a boring, monotonous episode, or I'm sorry, I misspoke. We actually played our first episode without it actually being recorded before we decided to turn into a podcast. So what I did is I actually took my story, uh, expanded on the points that we had for during play, and then I turned it into, it's very audiobook-esque. We have our production engineer, Daniel, uh, from 13 Palm Trees as well. He writes all his own custom music using uh, Logic from the the Apple Logic program, and then he wrote some great background noises. We worked together to create some good sound effects. I'm I'm not I'm not a bragger by any by any stretch of the imagination, but I it sounds really good. Right. So. And I, I my wife and I listened to the first episode. We uh we were driving to Pittsburgh this past Saturday to watch the Broadway or actually it was Sunday. Why does it even matter? Uh to watch <laughs> the Broadway version of Aladdin because uh That sounds she, awesome. She's a nerd. I'm a nerd. I teach music, okay? I love this kind of stuff. So it, it was awesome, actually. If you like Aladdin and you have love not seen Aladdin. the Broadway version, you have to do it. I love musicals anyways. But, you know, Aladdin was my favorite movie growing up. Anyways, we're already off track. That's going to happen a lot <laughs> on our shows, I'm sure. Uh, anyways. It might be gurus of gaming, but we're also gurus <clears throat> of other things, too. Gurus of everything <laughs> is what, I, what I'm going for. Uh, and I'm sure there's going to be tons of shenanigans and hijinks on D and D kind in future episodes. And oh man, that's why we called it D and D kind of. Well, it, it, I I saw it coming because we've known each other for over ten years. We've been friends for a long time. You were the best man at my wedding, um, and I know your whole crew on D and D kind of. And I know that all of those guys have no limit to their sense of humor, <laughs> meaning they're just like me. Meaning it's probably the best podcast on iTunes. 
I, you know, I don't want to say that it's the best, but it probably is. It, pro- it and it probably will be, and it, and you know, and that's obviously my personal opinion. But it's, and it has nothing to do with the amount of work that I put into it. It's not because I think it's funnier than anything else. It's just because it, we get together and we just have fun. Is like, it because you're good looking? I, I don't actually think that's it because I don't think I'm not, I don't think I'm good looking. I actually think I look like the underside of one of those disgusting lily pads in a shit pond. But that's about. <laughs> This podcast has been rated PG thirteen by Motion Pictures Association of America. Disclaimer. Explicit tag will be on explicit it. Explicit language. <laughs> and uh, Michael also hosts a really cool podcast. Episode one is out there right now called Video Game Mythos, where uh, he goes deep into the lore of different video game characters. That is also on iTunes. And you know, you were really making fun of yourself on that podcast when you said that you just realized that Navi was short for navigation. But you know what? I learned that by listening to Video Game Mythos. Dude, okay, so that's actually a really funny story. That was 100% true. I was doing some research, and I ran across that, and I just sat and stared at my computer for, and, I, and I'm being realistic what here, probably hell? a good, like, 45 seconds. Like, I, I mean, I don't, since it's been out, I've been, I've, I've loved that game. I've loved that franchise, and... That was one that just blew my mind. I mean, come on, dude. I played this game when I was in seventh grade, okay? <laughs> this was... Okay, how, how old was Little Rod in seventh grade? I was 12. This is 21 years ago. Like, the t- first time I played that game is now old enough to drink. Yes. And I'm just now <laughs> learning this. It's, yeah, it's ridiculous. It was, I, was, I was blown away by it, and there was an individual at work um, I, that I work with. His name is Daniel Bollinger, and he was listening to it i told him it was up he jumped on and checked it out and immediately afterwards he messaged me actually no it wasn't after it was during he shot me a g chat and it was like oh my gosh i've been playing this since it came out and i had no idea how did this happen without me knowing am i stupid (laughs) i mean that i felt stupid because i mean literally that's the point of that character is they guide you they navigate you through the game they steer you back on track it's like it's just never and now you know now i'm kind of sitting back wondering is there anything with with the fairies in Majora's Mask we don't know about? Like, what's? I guess stay tuned to Video Game Mythos and we'll find episode out. Episode thirteen, <laughs> Daddle. <laughs> Just I, I think as long as we don't hear a tingle episode, I think you're going to continue to have a fan base. I I don't ever actually. It's funny because the episode of of Navi actually kind of evolved kind of strangely. I actually uh, the individual I gave a shout out to in the show, another good friend of the both of us, uh, Alex Butera we got together to actually record that episode and it was actually like a two hour back and forth about different theories and things like that. It was a lot of good stuff that came out of that episode. But the problem was, is that I had some technical difficulties mid reel and didn't even realize it. So it was completely lost. Oh no. So what I did is I just told him, Hey, I'm going to go ahead and do this myself and no offense to you. Uh, I I I definitely want to get back together and maybe do another collab down the road. Uh, but we're just going to go ahead and publish what I got. And he was like, no, not a big deal at all. So big shout out to Alex Butera for <laughs> for my idiocy on that one. So um, now one of the other things I did hit on during the um, in the outtakes for that episode was a lot of the appearances of or special appearances from Navi. I touched a little bit on in the episode, but I noticed that there was a lot of stuff that Navi was in that like um, I touched on Link in the Portal of Doom. Had you ever heard of that before? I've never heard of it, yeah. So I read, I, I touched on it briefly and said it's not worth looking into. And it, it that wasn't a lie. It's not. It was really stupid. I actually took the time to read it while I was doing the research. Is it like one of those uh, like creepypastas, like the Majora's Mask thing? The whatever, What is that uh, That famous Majora's Mask creepypasta that's on the internet? Where oh, Ben. Uh, ben Drowns. It's like one of yeah. those kind of things. No, it's actually an actual book that oh. got published. And it's uh, it's terrible. It's, it's absolute garbage. Interesting. So... I know I actually have a Zelda book. I have, uh, I think the it's like Zelda and philosophy or something along those lines. Mm-hmm. Legend of Zelda and philosophy. I, I've never actually read it because I'm not a big philosophy guy. But, they uh, they actually have a lot of those. Every major video game and comic book character has like there's like a Batman and philosophy, and there's Batman X, is philosophy. Well, Batman is life. I mean, right. you can't you can't argue that. But this isn't you know this isn't gurus of comics. This no. is, well, this we're is, gurus uh, of everything. But <laughs> if you want to talk about Batman, you can listen to Hype and Cal. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, uh, th- those guys do a good job. They just need to talk about soccer more. 
<laughs> but speaking of gurus of gaming, this is the Gurus of Gaming podcast. Uh, basically, with the Gurus of Gaming, to give you some information on what this is, this is a group of gamers from West Virginia, rural West Virginia, because all the other gaming podcasts, those are based in San Francisco, somewhere out there. But, you know, we're out here, and there's really nothing else like this in the area. And there's several of us friends that want to get together and talk about video games. And you're going to see us talk about uh, newer games, retro games, pretty much anything gaming related. And, of course, I already mentioned Michael is going to be one of our rotating. Can we talk about love games? Absolutely. I'm, lo- I'm old Greg. Love games. Playing them love games. Playing I'm love sorry. Games. I derailed you there. Yes, I am a rotating panelist. And you will also see uh, Justin, who will be a rotating panelist on the podcast. Uh, I'm working on a deal with my buddy Ryan to be a rotating panelist. And uh, each week I'll be joined by my co-host, but not today. That is uh, Mr. Josh Falmsby. And uh, every week he's going to bring you a segment called uh, Falmsby Files, which is going to be the news segment of the podcast. And I say every week. I am very much looking forward to. I'm saying every week, but to be more realistic, it might be every two weeks. We're, we're going to see how it goes. Um, yeah, and that's that's one thing about podcasting, and I don't mean to get too meta here, is that people don't realize all the work that goes into this stuff. I mean, it's it's hours and hours and hours of time spent editing and mixing and mastering and collecting content. So, you know, we'll see how it evolves. I'm I am very excited that Roger asked me to be a part of this. This is actually, you know, he he mentioned in the beginning this is definitely a passion project. But what we're what we're doing here, it goes beyond just a passion project, and it being something that we're just passionate about in general so you know i know we're i'm getting kind of meta here but i do definitely appreciate the opportunity oh absolutely and i'm, I'm definitely glad to be here because like i said i have a full-time job this is for fun justin's got a full-time job ryan's got a full-time job falmsby has a kid <laughs> <laughs> no to be fair falmsby is a very hard-working musician yeah, exactly. like josh plays music almost every night all over the state he's everywhere and he takes care of his son you know, while uh, his wife also works full time. So, you know, it's uh, we're, we're all busy people with busy lives, but we want to do this uh, because it's fun and we want to inform more people about what we love. And I, I think that's actually important, too, because whenever you release a podcast or release any kind of project where, you know, reality is people don't get paid to sit around and talk about games unless you work for like IGN. So bringing you real life information from the desk of people who have jobs just like the listeners do who have you know kids just like the listeners do and have tons of stuff to do just like the real people out there who are the listeners i think it means that much more i totally agree so let's do let's get down to why why we're here michael let's talk about video games what are you playing right now i know you're a busy person but like what's what's in your playstation or your xbox or your switch upstairs so for my xbox i'm actually replaying through dead space oh, good choice oh it's so good so i found a typo in dead space actually really yeah in the um i actually posted it on facebook and one of the you know how you're going through dead space you got like the creepy hallways and above like the elevators and stuff there's like the writing that scrolls across yeah like those panels it's supposed to say mining control it says mining control. Control. I looked it up to make sure I wasn't stupid. Control is not a word. Right. So, so I thought that was kind of cool. But no, that uh, Dead Space is. I, I thought it was. It was extremely pivotal to the survival horror genre. It was like they take the idea of what Resident Evil Four brought back to the table, and they mashed it up with a genre that's very rarely touched on. This whole like space genre because i mean you can you can do so many things with space but so many people mess it up right and you know it's, it's, it's interesting you mentioned Resident Evil Four with that because dead space really does even down to the gameplay elements and like the over the shoulder camera takes so much from Resident Evil 4 and it should i mean you they had a great formula it was one of the most successful resident evil games capitalizing on a franchise that had waited too long to do anything so i mean you you take a formula that was already immensely successful and you you give it to a team that had a passion for nothing except for bringing a horror game back. I mean, we all know, I don't know if anyone, all the listeners know this, but I mean, the way that dead space came around is, I mean, it was made by EA games, one of the most despised gaming companies in the world. And they took, you know, the money they make from Madden and NBA and all these other things. And they just threw it to a team of developers and said, Hey, you guys do whatever you want with this money. And they were like, sweet. We're bringing out dead space. And it was incredible. And of course, you know, Dead Space was really, you know, really successful. Had a super successful sequel. Uh, they had they had Dead Space Three. 
<laughs> which wasn't quite as as uh, popular as Dead Space One and Two. But uh, you know, it's um, well, you know, you're, you're you're part of a company that I mean, EA literally is about cash grabs. You know, they bring in, um, you know, they have Madden every year, uh, soccer games every year, a sport. I mean, literal, just every sport game every year, and they're just cash grabs. I mean, what? I mean, literally thinking about it, what tweaks do they really have to make every year to those? They're just it's free money for them, right? And I mean, and we're not going to get into uh, the cash grab that is Star Wars Battlefront with what they. <laughs> With how they've just bastardized oh, that series. Gosh, I played the crap out of the first one when it came out until they were like, oh, yeah, there's this thing called microtransactions. And oh, then it God. was just, it just went so downhill. But no, so I was, I've played through Dead Space. Actually, I'm about to finish it up. Um, that's the only thing I've been playing on Xbox. Uh, my Switch has went relatively unused other than the occasional Mario Kart with uh, the fiance and the kids. Um, but my PC, however, two things I've been playing on there. Uh, they are billions, which is incredible. You know, I've heard about We Are Billions. I've looked at it. I've almost bought it a couple of times, but I haven't pulled the trigger on it yet. Tell me about that game. So, the reason I love that game. So, obviously, They Are Billions is a it's a survival horror RTS. So, kind of like uh, StarCraft, something like that, um, or Age of Empires. But essentially, the idea is that you have this civilization. Uh, on this flat map that's all covered, just like most other RTSs are, and there are zombies just roaming the map. That sounds great. And the infection, the idea is to build your colony and try to go as long as you can without an infection. But the thing about that game is, is that in order to build a building, you have to have workers or colonists to in order to populate and work for that building. So if that building gets infected, all of those people become zombies. So if that building has requires 10 workers to work, whenever that building gets taken down, it actually, all the zombies that attacked it, plus all the workers that are inside of it, and the infection just spreads. So it's kind of like StarCraft meets The Walking Dead. It That's literally exactly what it is. Right. So it's a, it's a lot of fun to actually play. It's a lot of fun to get involved in. Uh, I love the attention to detail and the mechanics. The graphics are great if you zoom all the way in. It's got kind of like a... A realistic cell shade to it um the one of my favorite things about the game is that you have to maintain your resources so you have to have uh power you have to have uh food for everything and that gives you the stats on all those things so you can keep up with it but the most important thing about it is let's say you have five or 50 food and then you build this building that requires 49 and then you lose this one farm or something like that and it knocks you down below if you go more than like two days sub food a portion of your town will die and they'll turn into the infected internally and then your the infection spreads you know that kind of sounds like another steam game that i recently uh played a couple of hours i've just tried out it was called uh, frostpunk i've never heard of that yeah so frostpunk basically takes place in uh i it's kind of post-apocalyptic basically a nuclear winter is set in and i may be totally wrong on that please send corrections to uh to us on our Facebook page, if I'm wrong on that. <laughs> but uh, basically, you're in a frozen wasteland, and you're some of the last survivors, and you're setting up basically a new civilization. Hmm. And you've got to you know, find a way to power your civilization, to feed your civilization. Uh, it's, it's a really cool game. But that, that kind of sounds a, a little bit similar to that, but I've, I've heard... I've heard more good things about We Are Billions than I have about Frostpunk. Not to take anything away from that game, because uh, reviews were great. It is a fun game. Yeah, I'm, They Are Billions was... it. I don't remember exactly when it came out, but I know that I bought it shortly after the release, and I think it was in... It's still in pre... They only have a survival mode right now. I know they're actually currently working on uh, releasing a campaign for it. December 13th, 2017 uh, is when this game came to early access on Steam. Okay, so that... It's almost a year, and right. they're, they have... Can, I mean... Every other week or so, they release new updates and mechanics to the survival mode that actually makes it a lot more fun to play. So, um, yeah, I mean, so I've been playing that. And the other game I've been playing on PC, another early access game that was super excited for was uh, Hunt Showdown. I've seen that on Steam as well. It is a lot, a lot of fun. And that's a survival game, correct? So it's actually... You take survival horror and like mash it up with, uh, let's say, PUBG or like Fortnite. It's essentially they drop you into like a open battlefield. It's like a, it's like a post-apocalyptic Victorian kind of era. There's weird like zombies. You're using muskets and hatchets and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, it's like that 
farmy kind of Victorian feel. But essentially, they drop you on a map. You don't know how many people are on it. You can literally spawn into a server by yourself. And as you're going, you have to harvest, use your dark sense and find clues. And then the clues will, when you collect the clues, they'll narrow the map as to where the main uh, beast or monster is you have to fight. So other players, if you run on crows or random dying animals or stuff like that that'll make noises, or if you shoot your gun or things like that, other players will be attuned to where your position is. So you can either run across them, you might not hit them at all, but once you've come across them, you obviously you fight, you can kill them if you want to try to run away or escape. But the scary thing is, is once you collect all the clues and get to the bounty or the monster, you kill it and collect the bounty, and then everyone on the map knows where you're at. So not only do you have to get there, try to fight, it takes about five minutes to actually collect the bounty. So people know where you are when you're collecting the bounty, and you have to try to survive as they're trying to attack you after you just fought the monster. It's very difficult because once you collect the bounty, then you have to get to the edge of the map and escape. It's ve- And so a lot of people will camp the exit. So it's it kind of sucks, but it's a, it's a lot of fun. I highly recommend it. The community is really great. A lot of the stream reviews actually say the otherwise, but I have yet to run into a single person that wasn't both helpful and informative. It taught me a lot of new things playing with other players. Well, one of the one of the things too that I see when I'm kind of doing a little bit of research on this game, uh, that's it's developed by Crytek, and that's you know that's a company with a pedigree. They're best known for the Crisis games, mm-hmm. and you know all three of those games were critically acclaimed. Uh, provided your computer could run them when they came out. Right. <laughs> uh, more recently, Rise: Son of Rome on the Xbox One. So. Uh, yeah, it's definitely sounds like a cool game. Um, I've been kind of bouncing between a few games recently myself, and like you, my Switch is kind of sitting at the moment. Um, <clears throat> let's be honest, for the Switch, we're, I think we're all just sitting back waiting for Super Smash Brothers Ultimate. Yeah, and that's but that's actually the kind of thing about the Switch is this, I don't think anyone's Switch, unless you have you know a bunch of kids, gets a lot of use because Nintendo themselves they are a system for our generation Correct. they really are so like but the thing is is like you could be playing halo you could be playing your maddens you could be playing your call of duties but if you're part of that generation that was a big fan of the the nintendo main console titles when a mario game or metroid game or zelda game comes out there is no other game no that's you're that's it down <laughs> you play that nonstop. exactly and no other game can claim that <laughs> that is how it goes excuse me i'm fighting off allergies this week so you may hear me cough or sniffle uh, so one of the games I've been putting a lot of time into recently, uh, you you mentioned Early Access games. This is a game that actually just came out of Early Access a couple of weeks ago, and that is Dead Cells. I which, have not heard of this. So uh, Dead Cells is available on Steam, Xbox One, PS4, and I, it is also on the Switch. Uh, Dead Cells is a Metroidvania roguelike Already interested. title. So uh, you you know you go through your runs, you're in like a... a I, I, it's definitely a Metroidvania, I, I already said that. So each time you respawn, you start with nothing. And as you go along through the game, you find blueprints for different items. And as you unlock them and unlock different abilities, each time you start, there'll be new equipment for you to use during your run. You find new equipment during your run. Um, Think of it as a cross between Castlevania Symphony of the Night and Dark Souls. Wow. I think it's really, wow. that is the best way to describe it. That sounds terrible. Like, not in a bad way. Like, that. Like I I would love playing it, but I'd want to hang myself while I was playing yeah, it. But that the sounds thing is, really though, difficult. Like, you know, when, when I sit down and play it, I can't put it down. And sometimes I'll, I'll sit down and play it, and I'll start a run, and the run might last 10, 15 minutes, and I'll, you know, I'll get bombarded and die before I get to the first boss. Other times, I'll go through 45 minutes. Now, I have yet to go through an entire run. There, I believe there are three bosses in the game, but like everything's procedurally generated. So even though there are set paths that you take, so like let's say you're in the first area, you have the choice between two different areas to go to next, hmm. and you'll choose which one to go into, and then that one also has branching paths. Um, I've only been to the second boss twice, and I only beat him once. Uh, definitely a difficult game, but it's Really highly recommend it. It's one of the better games I've played this year. Sounds a lot like Heroes of Hammer Watch. I don't know if you've ever played that. I haven't, but I, I think I've, I the name of the game sounds familiar. Uh, one of one of my friends, Ryan Wilfong, he actually bought a copy of it to, for me to play with him. Um, and I didn't really think much of it, but it's it's another one of those rogue, procedurally generated roguelike RPGs where you choose a character, you go through procedurally generated dungeons, you can choose your own path, but at the end of that level, it's always the same path. 
but I mean, God, that game is that game is hard. But yeah, that's, no, that's it sounds, the way Dead sounds a lot like it. Yeah, definitely. If that's not a game you've checked out and you like Metroidvanias, uh, that's definitely recommended. And the other one, which actually I've been, uh, if you check out our Twitch channel, it's uh, twitch.tv slash gurus of gaming. I've been live streaming Guacamelee 2. I was curious about that. Yeah. So, uh, and it, you're, you're going to tell immediately I'm a fan of Metroidvania games because Guacamelee 2 is a Metroidvania. Um, which, Wasn't your favorite game Castle Symphony of the Night? Uh, Castlevania Symphony, Castlevania of Symphony, Symphony of the Night is number three. Number three on my top games of all time. I'm, and, I'm sure we'll get to the other ones. Though, oh, for in sure, a for sure. We, at some point, we're going to record a uh, our, our top five, top ten games of all time episode. That's definitely for another day. But um, Guacamelee is a game that, if you've ever played it, does not take itself seriously. Um, That's good. It's like of, my life. Exactly right. Um, one of the hallmarks of the game is really its humor, and it makes a lot of references to other video games. Huh. You know, for example... It's like um, the Shrek of video games. It is kind of like the Shrek of video games, now <laughs> that you mention it. You know, for example, I saw uh, you know, just by walking through some of the early areas in Guacamelee 2, uh, you see posters hung up on buildings for uh, like luchador matches between He-Man and Skeletor. Of course, they're <laughs> they're mixed up to have like slightly different names, but you still obviously know what's going on. Right. And uh, there's like the Super Hermanos poster, which obviously was a, is a nod to the Super Mario Brothers. And, I got. Uh, I was watching your. I got kind of like a. Um, and correct me if I'm wrong, and because this could be totally bogus, I got like a uh, little Big Planet vibe almost from it. Um, in in a lot of ways. Uh, especially, it, with it, the, with maybe, the jumping, maybe, maybe it was just in the sense that it didn't take itself too seriously. Yeah, that's probably where you're getting it. It's yeah. it's more in like the light heartedness of the game. Yes, that's now, what... mind you, it's kind of a dark story because um, I, I wouldn't really consider this a spoiler because uh, let's be fair here, the original Guacamelee has been out for five or six years. There's probably going to be a lot of spoilers there's, in this. There's going to be spoilers, but if you haven't played the original Guacamelee, I'm sorry, but you've had six plus years. It's okay. Uh, one of the first things that happens in that game is you die. Oh, great! Yeah, your your character. <laughs> dies that's part of the storyline now it's not like dark souls where you die over and over again but it plays in the story okay you're dead you come back as the famous masked luchador and you have to sell, save el presidente's daughter from uh from the undead skeletons hmm. and uh, that's awesome <laughs> humor all the way through really funny game definitely check it out hmm. so since we're on the topic of really fun games i know I know the whole point of us getting together is to talk about, you know, what's coming in games. And I know I'm back to this whole Nintendo grind that we were just on. I, I can't, I can't stop myself from asking cause I'm so excited for it. How are you feeling about smash brothers? So my buddy, Justin and I, one of the things we have a habit of doing is if there's a game that comes out that we're really excited about is we'll, we'll, we'll download. And this is going to sound really lame. We'll download a countdown app onto our That's phones. That's not lame at all. I and actually have one for Smash Brothers. We'll set it in the release date. <laughs> and so far, you know, Justin and I have been friends for years. There have been three occasions we've used the countdown. The first was for Final Fantasy 15, which fair, was fair. a great game. The second was for the Nintendo Switch slash Breath of the Wild. Mm. We now Amazing game. have a Smash countdown. And it's worth noting, and we'll talk about this another time, that as soon as the Smash countdown expires, it's going to turn into a Resident Evil 2 remake. Oh my goodness, countdown. don't even get me started on that. I'm well, so pumped. We're, we're probably going to spend a whole podcast talking about that. Oh gosh. But, you know, Smash to me, that's just, it's comfort food of games. It is. And it, it's not even like the normal comfort food and people are like, yeah, I'll watch this because it's fun. I'll play this because it's good. It's something like that. But like Smash Brothers in thralls me like when i play it like oh, totally. it's it's competitive and like i'm i am the kind of like f for instance smash brothers on the wii u uh when a couple of when i first bought my house a couple of my good friends moved in and were living with me prior to my fiance moving in but i mean it was a nightly occurrence it was almost i i would venture to say at least 20 hours a week of smash brothers and we and <laughs> You know, pardon the Bandai Namco phrasing here, but we got good. Like, you got good. We, we were very good, and I have yet. To, and I don't. I don't mean to sound that make this sound like a challenge. Other than the random people we play with online, it was few and far between. But we are very good at this game. And so I, I will say this now: when Super Smash Bros. Ultimate does come out, um, we're definitely going to do a big Twitch stream through Gurus of Gaming, 
Um, where we're going to get together and we're all going to play several, several modes. And you know, the cool thing about Smash is it's one of those few games. And I like watching people play video games. I, I'm cool with sitting down watching a Twitch stream of things. I love watching like games on quick speed run, things like that. But Smash is one of those very few games that's actually just as, if not more fun to watch. I agree. I agree. As it is to play. And I think that they lost something in the um, in the Wii U remake, and I think in the Wii remake, when they took out the tournament mode, adding that back in was the most exciting. And there's tons of new features to the new Smash Brothers. Right. Adding the tournament mode back into Smash, it, it is changing the way that I feel about this game. It is so good because well, you're right. You can you can watch the game and be it be fun. And now that they have this tournament tree where you can root, you can even put it like I used to put it on all computers and then bet on who would who would end up being in the victory. So well, and a lot of people consider Brawl a misstep. Um, I know a lot of people who are diehard Smash Bros. fans who do not like Super Smash Bros. Brawl. Right. And you know, I was I was personally fine with the game. I played a good bit of it. Yeah, me too. But you know, the tournament scene definitely died down, and it, it really goes back to show when you see Smash Brothers being played competitively. Mm-hmm. When Evo rolls around every year, the Smash Brothers game that they're playing is always melee. Mm. Now we'll say this: I know that a lot of people, you know, every every year the big hoorah, or sorry, not every year, but every release of a Smash Brothers, the big hoorah is. Hey, they're releasing a GameCube controller for us to play with. I went. I originally got really into Melee, or I'm sorry, really into Brawl. It was the one that I actually started to get really good at, and I got good on the Wii controller. And this will be the first one where I'm not allowed to use the Wii controller. Oh, that right, was, because there's no Wii controller compatibility. Exactly. On the, the that was my that was my jam. Everyone was like, "I want the GameCube controller. I want the classic controller. I want this. I want that." And I was the only one that was like, "I need a Wii controller. I need a nunchuck." That's the only way I can play. So hopefully that translates really well with the uh, the Joy Con. I think the Joy Con was really going to uh, just based on the setup of the controller itself. When you're using a single Joy Con, I think it's going to probably feel pretty good. Other than the, the obvious size difference right. between a Joy Con and the, and the now Wii I need remote. I need both. I played the Wii Remote and Nunchuck. Nice. Like I had in hand, and I was I was pretty good. And like I said, I there's not very many people I know that are better than me at Smash Brothers. So I'm excited to see how. If I'm excited I can to see use... you play Justin in Smash Brothers. That's going to be the showdown right there. I would, uh, master. So it was actually funny. Funny story is uh, my sister, whenever she actually lived in the apartment that I have in my house, she had one of her friends over that was who would always talk about how good he is at Smash Brothers. And so I was, you know, my sister was like, hey, my brother's really good at Smash Brothers. You guys should team up sometimes. So he actually came over just to challenge me in Smash Brothers. So he actually came over and he came down. He brought his game controller. I just walked downstairs and I popped in, you know, I jumped on. And whenever I came down, I bought, I brought a box of tissues and my mop downstairs with me. And he, I walked in and he was really confused. And I was, he's like, what's the mop for? And I was like, well, the, the tissues are for, the mop is for whenever I mop the floor with you. And the <laughs> tissues are for whenever you're crying when you're done. And, and I didn't, I'm not going to say I like whipped his ass because it was, it was definitely a good match, but I definitely cleaned the floor with him and it wasn't even close. And this guy was like the best that he, that he thought he was the best. So I'm very excited. That's a great story for me. So who's your main? (laughs) My main, it actually varies because I feel when I play, I'm un I'm unstoppable with Link. Obviously, you know, Link, Link is an overpowered character. For though. Super Smash Bros. at the original and for Melee, Link was always my go-to. Link is a great And even in character. Brawl, I used Link a lot. But as we got into uh, to Wii U, and even in Brawl some, I started to branch out and use a lot more characters. Right, yeah, and I'm, and I'm the same way. So I got extremely good. My other go-to character, if like people are, people will literally tell me I'm not allowed to play with Link. This is not fair. Right. So I don't play with Link, and I play with Lucina. Lucina is my other like go-to character. I don't even play Fire Emblem, but Lucina is my jam. So on Wii U 3DS, I really started to use a lot of uh, Villager. Mm, you know, Daniel's I, I, character. Villager is a lot of fun to play, and Pac-Man also. Um, it, I just embraced those new characters in 3DS Wii U. And I still use Link some, but definitely not to the extent that I used in the older titles. Just because I, I love the aesthetic of playing with Pac-Man. Exactly. Yeah, Pac-Man's awesome. And, you know, I, I like to use Mega Man, but at the same time, I'm not a huge fan of Mega Man as a Smash character. He just, he doesn't feel as good. And I, don't get me wrong. Mega Man is one of those series that I hold near and dear. But I just don't feel as comfortable 
playing as Mega Man in Smash as I do with some of the other characters. I feel the same way about Mega Man as I felt about Snake. Because whenever he was in, I do believe it was Brawl. Yes. Um, Snake was in. And I felt as if he was dumbed down. Because there's a, Snake is a, such a such an awesome video game character. Oh, he's, the original Metal Gear Solid is just one of the best games ever made. It, no it's, it's amazing. But the problem is, is you get you try to smash every no pun intended, but you try to smash everything that Snake was into one character with a limited move set like that, and you're gonna have some disappointments. And that's the oh, way I sure. felt about Mega for Man because sure. Mega Man's. I mean, you have to. It's like limitless different powers. With ex- Mega exactly. Man. They had literally ten Mega Man games worth of powers. That they had to choose from, yep. for just a limited move set in a game like Smash. Yeah, and I don't, I don't blame Nintendo because I'm, I'm stoked that they tried to inter- integrate that character into the game. But there was just, regardless of what move sets you would have chosen, you could literally make the me character that you can customize a Mega Man and have still plenty of content. Oh, for sure. Like, and you know they, uh, they, they wanted you to use Mega Man as me characters because some of the DLC packages for for Super Smash Brothers for Wii U. Was you know there was the X costume, there was a Zero costume. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think there might have been a Proto Man costume. <sighs> so they were you know they were saying, okay, hey, do your own thing with Mega Man here with your Me Fighters. If our if the Mega Man in the game doesn't suit you, you can play as X by doing this. Yep. So yeah, that's great. Can we talk about that last Smash Brothers trailer? Let's that, do it. That came out. Um, so I'm super excited because I kind of lost my shit. At Simon Belmont being a Smash Brothers. Well, right. I mean, I, you being a Castlevania fan, I could definitely, I could definitely. Justin see that. and I were watching this, and he he, he lost it at King K. Rule. Yeah, which yeah. I know you're a Donkey Kong fan too. We I, I, we're all excited to see King K. Rule. I I am excited. I was curious about his his integration into Smash Brothers. Like he's a so the 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 thing that got me was like you look at all these Smash Brothers characters, and you know one nobody. Nobody cares that they're adding more Fire Emblem characters into Smash Brothers. I love you, Nintendo, but stop. Like, there are there's a million of them, right? And you're gonna ha- and they all do the exact same stuff and with water effects or fire effects, and it's just I'm not into it. But like seeing a brand new line that's so big and so powerful, and the story is so good, actually getting the love and attention it deserves, like Castlevania. Oh man, I am so excited! Yeah, and you know, not only are we getting Simon, but Richter Belmont's an Echo character. Yes, and I was really excited about that. Now, I would love to have seen Alucard as a playable, but I'll take assist him as, as an assist cool. trophy. Poor Luigi, <laughs> just uh, gets outright <laughs> murdered by death in I, that trailer. I mean, at this point, you know that's Luigi. Like he's just he's the character that is literally there to get shit on. He's that friend in the group. Well, and can we talk about dedication to a gimmick in that particular Smash Direct? You know, in the opening trailer of that Smash Direct, we see Luigi getting mercilessly killed by death, followed by Simon Belmont something in to save, well, it's too late to save Luigi, but to take care of business. <laughs> we didn't see Luigi in any shape or form in the entire rest of the Nintendo Direct. <laughs> Not in any of the gameplay. Nowhere. Like, Luigi was nowhere to be found at any time for the rest of the 25 minutes. He probably left because he was so mad that they just made an amazing game like Luigi's Mansion and then just shit on it with Dark Moon and then just have abandoned that franchise altogether. And then when they remake Luigi's Mansion, it goes on the 3DS and not on the Switch. Oh, man. Don't even get me started. God, that is such a disappointment. I mean, Sakurai has, you know, with, with the new Smash Brothers, he's been pretty, pretty ruthless. I mean, you think to the... Uh, one of the initial trailers of the game when they revealed Ripley, Ripley killed Mario and Mega Man. Oh, you, Ridley. Ripley. Ridley. Ripley. What, this is an alien. Ridley. Yeah. What, <laughs> what am I saying? I was Ridley. confused there for a second because it was a very it was a very alien esque kind of trailer. Yeah, this is very. But true. yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, they they did like I mean, he's, Ridley's killing people, and then you got uh, you got Death killing people. You know, it's just. Uh, this is this is getting dark for Nintendo, and I'm okay with it. It's about time they delve back into their roots. I mean, you got to consider the original stories. Where I mean, Resident Evils. I mean, dark stuff. I mean, some of the original like original NES titles and the theories surrounding Mario and things like that. And you can get more into that on Video Game Mythos, which I'll definitely be exploring. But I mean, get it. Darkness is in their roots. I mean, the the Samus's original storylines crazy well just kind of think about this for a second look at the original legend of zelda game how many living people do you actually see in that game 
I, you see, you see a few old men who look exactly alike. Yeah, and that's really about it. Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, even what Link to the Past. I mean, you don't think about it, so you start out, and your your uncle, I do believe it is, is immediately. Yeah, he, he dies. He died. He's dead. Spoilers. So then you're going through, and you're in this castle, and these guys are trying to stop you, and you're killing them. But think about this: those are just Hillian guards that are just in the castle doing their job. And you're just Link yeah. ruthlessly you're, you're, murdering you're, you're, them. You're killing those guys. They don't know. I mean, are they being brainwashed by Aghanim? Maybe. Yeah, but be or be, maybe they're they still think this business as usual. This kid's infiltrating our castle. We got to take care of exactly. this. Exactly. Whenever we specifically told him at the front gate, he wasn't allowed in. He's in here. They're trying to do their jobs in a world full of links and in a world full of bad people. Be a Batman. Be someone that knows how to n- knock people out without killing them. Because, man, like us, I mean, back to the original point, Nintendo, ruthless here, you're killing me. I'll probably, literally, you're killing me. You're kill, Mike Bonner's going to die <laughs> in the next uh, next Smash trailer. You're, you're welcome. First. Spoilers <laughs> again. <laughs> but, so Ridley in Smash. So, two things. So, obviously, I was a little let down. Not the fact that they added Ridley. Super pumped about that. The thing I was let down with was the fact that they, it's like, so the the Metroid level in Super Smash Brothers Wii U where you have Ridley flying back and forth and you can hurt Ridley and then eventually get rid of uh, him on the map. But they took this character that was like, it's so big and so powerful. It's uh, just this relationship, this mental strain that Ridley just brings on Samus. And then they pop it into Smash Brothers. It almost like is insulting to the aura and the presence of Ridley because whenever Ridley shows up in a Metroid game, it is is powerful. Like it is crazy because Ridley was the original cause of Samus's parents' death. Exactly. So you know, Samus has that emotional hatred, a deep hatred for Ridley. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, that's why Ridley's always showing up every game. Yep. That's that's why when I played through the uh, the remake of Metroid Two, I wanted to pull my hair out in the Ridley fight. You know, things like that. It's just. (laughs) Yeah, you're ab- you're absolutely right. great game by the way. Oh, absolutely. if you haven't played that that Metroid 2 remake on the 3DS, absolutely do it. Worth your time. I mean, it's not as good as Super Metroid, but let's be fair. Well, not very games few are. games are good as. Not many yeah. games are as good as that game. <laughs> and you're a Metroid guy, so. Uh, Metroid is my favorite uh Samus. I, w- I don't want to say Metroid is my favorite series. It's it's if it's not number 1, it's number 2, but Samus is definitely my favorite video game character. Oh, with good reason. Amazing. I think that's a potential spoiler on something that might show up in video game mythos at some point. Eh, it's fine. That just means that you're getting extra treats for listening to all of our content exactly. instead of just one versus exactly. the other. So, but so th- other characters too. I mean, who else are we looking at as new characters? We have got King K. Rule, Simon, Richter, Ridley. Well, yeah, we've got some uh, some Echo Fighters that have been announced. Of course, uh, Dark Samus is going to be the, an Echo Fighter oh, of man. Samus. Metroid. Um, More Metroid love. <clears throat> Crom is in the game as a metro, as an Echo Fighter of I want to say Ike. Crom, oh, another Fire Emblem character. Yeah, again, send uh, send corrections to our Facebook page, Cruise the <laughs> Gaming on Facebook, because I, I when I say he's an Echo Fighter of Ike, I feel like that's ninety percent wrong. It's okay. It's not a big but deal. It'll be okay. It's it's a Fire Emblem character, and I don't mean to be the guy that shits on Fire Emblem, but I'm just not a big fan of the game. As a game fi- as a fan of Fire Emblem, personally. I can agree that Smash is getting oversaturated with the Fire Emblem games. I agree, and I like the Fire Emblem games. I haven't played them all, but Fire Emblem Awakening is is a really good game. I mean, they have so many other characters, and people are getting so excited about you know the fact that they're finally bringing more Metroid characters and main main story characters into Smash from these big name titles, and yet they still are sitting on even with the addition of Ridley and uh dark samus into smash that's still only four characters and one of those is the same person just broke up in the different suits exactly and keep in mind we have now and i i love zelda we have three links yeah absolutely and i I feel like we're getting dangerously close to having zelda being a little oversaturated in the smash bros games yeah and you're right i mean think about all the other characters throughout the other franchises that could could make an appearance i mean Where's Waluigi other than an assist trophy? I mean, come on. People want Waluigi in Smash uh, Waluigi Brothers. Waluigi is definitely, from people I've talked to, one of the most requested characters that we haven't seen. And Shovel Knight is an assist trophy? No, Shovel Knight needs to be a thing. That's I, oh, I feel man. like they have dropped the ball on that. I agree. Because that's I another agree. one of those characters that is in high demand. You and know, if you haven't played Shovel Knight... 
do it. I mean, just that old school, classic retro gaming platforming feel. Personally, I feel like we've probably seen most of the new regular character reveals. I think there are going to be some characters that are revealed for DLC. But I have a feeling between now and the launch of the game that we might see one or two more just new characters. But I think they're going to focus more on more of the Echo Fighters. Um, if we don't see Ken as an Echo Fighter for Ryu, I'll be totally <laughs> shocked. Uh, same goes for Shadow the Hedgehog with Sonic. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I feel like those are two... Well, Shadow's an assist trophy currently. Uh, he was in in, uh, in the Wii U, but the only assist trophy from the Sonic series they've shown for Ultimate was Knuckles. Oh, Which they showed okay. at the Nintendo Direct. Which gotcha. makes me think, you know, maybe they showed off Knuckles and, you know, Shadow's going to move into being an assist trophy possibly. Or not assist, I'm sorry, into being an Echo Fighter. But, you know, those two to me just feel like complete locks. Yeah, I mean, you, they gotta, you really have to consider your fan base, too. And they've, they went so all out on this game. And I'm, I'm not to say that I'm not appreciative, but I feel like there were gaps in what they, they missed. They went, they went X distance on some franchises and went a quarter of that on others when the level of effort and the demand were much lower and higher, respectively, right. for other characters. And, you know, you mentioned with, with Metroid and Donkey Kong. Especially with Donkey Kong. Donkey Kong is one of Nintendo's flagship franchises. Yep. But they only have three Donkey Kong characters. Yeah. Now in three. Smash. <laughs> now three. Now that we're adding King K. Rule. I mean, what a, I mean, you get Dixie Kong, Donkey Kong Jr. I mean, even Lanky Kong and Chunky Kong from the 64. Oh, funky There's, Kong. There are so many good choices that you could put in there. I would love to see Chunky getting up there with his triangle and smashing out a song. Oh man, like there's so many really. Who, who cool... was that? Uh, who was that Kong you could play as in Donkey Kong Country Three? The baby. Who was that? You that was Donkey name? Kong Junior, wasn't it? I don't think so. I believe Donkey Kong Junior is actually technically the current Donkey Kong. Oh. And Cranky Kong that. is the uh, original DK. I didn't know that. Yes, that is actually that's yeah, some that's weird a, that's stuff. That's a confirmed Nintendo thing. Thang. You can tell we're from West Virginia. <laughs> now, Cranky Kong is actually Donkey Kong from the original Donkey Kong arcade game. And what? In in what franchise or where did that start? I guess what game did that Donkey start? Donkey Kong in? Country. Donkey Kong Country. And Cranky then, is from the original one throwing the barrels. Yes, correct. Oh man! And then Donkey Kong himself was DK Junior from Donkey Kong Junior. Holy crap! I am blown away right now. Yeah, this is another Navi t- thing for today me. Today like, we learned. Today we yeah, learned. Yeah, I did not know that. That's Which, amazing. That's a, that's a really cool fact about the Donkey Kong series. But you know, especially you mentioned Dixie Kong. How she's not shown up. And that could easily be an Echo Fighter for uh, for Diddy. She could use her her hair twirls, not B, just do a little minor adjustment to make it work. He wouldn't really have to do a whole new move set for her. Yeah, just slap a skin, or maybe even an Echo character for Diddy Kong. That's, like, that's what I'm saying. You know? that, yeah, that could that would be super easy to do. What other characters do you think that w- have not been confirmed so far that could show up as their own character, and not an Echo? Oh man, I am not good at stuff like this. So. I would really like to see a. Um, I know we already talked about our Waluigi, um, and but they already confirmed him wasn't an assist trophy. They confirmed him as an assist trophy. Okay, that's a that's a huge bummer. It is. Um, I would really like to see a Toad, only because Toad Toad's been getting a lot of attention in the Mario franchise and the Captain Toad series. I would really like to, even if obviously there's no way to really make him an Echo character, but like I don't know how they do it, but I would like to see more of. Of Toad. I can agree with that. I think the only thing holding Toad back is the fact that it was established, especially in Captain Toad, Toad doesn't jump. There is not a, a jump button in Captain Toad. Mm. Of course, mind you, it's a puzzle game. And it's a really fun one if you haven't played it. And it just came out on Switch last month and the 3DS. I have not played it. I played Mario Odyssey, obviously. But... Right, and there were there were a few Captain Toad levels there. And there were Captain Toad levels in, uh, I want to say, Super Mario 3D World, I think is where that originated on the Wii U. Okay, I didn't know that either. Yep, that's where uh, that's where Captain Toad originally came from. Was from that game on the Wii U. Gotcha. Now I did. I would like to see. I don't know about new characters that aren't confirmed. I would like to see it's such an underrated game, Metroid Prime Hunters, and the original and the Bounty Hunters uh, that were in Metroid Prime Three Corruption. I would like them to be assist trophies because, that's, like I be cool like I said, Metroid is such an underrated, under spotlighted thing that key it's it's one of nintendo's biggest sellers it's the like the thing that like i look forward to other than zelda games is metroid games and if they brought back 
all the the cool bounty hunters from the Hunter series, and even if it's like one assist trophy and they all show up, I wouldn't care. I want to see that. Right. So, and aside from like that prediction that you had, is, are, do you have like a dream big? I would do anything oh, to have man. this character in this game. I don't know. Dream big. Any character I could choose from any Nintendo. Uh, yeah, and I yes. would keep in mind, keep it to games because a lot of people were saying, oh, put Goku in the game. No, now, I'm, I, I'm no, not, I'm I'm not, not okay with that. that. That's <laughs> not, you know, keep it to video games. Smash the love letter to gaming. Right. I would really like to see, and this maybe it's just my love for other franchises bleeding in. I would really like to see a uh, Leon Kennedy make its way into Smash Bros. I think Leon Kennedy would be a good fit because, I mean, you think about it. The Resident Evil characters always worked well in Marvel vs. Capcom. Mm-hmm. Yep. And I often would use the Resident Evil characters in those games. So I definitely think there's a good fit. Um, yeah, I'm just a big Leon Kennedy fan. I, I don't know. Daniel wrote a song about Leon Kennedy, and Daniel's my brother, also works here for us at 13 Palm Trees. But uh, he wrote a song about Leon Kennedy, and when I was, I was young, he was a big Resident Evil nerd. And ever since then... I've really liked it, and I've obviously played all the Resident Evil games, crazy good games, and Leon Kennedy is by far that or Chris Redfield. And like I said, you could even make the Mecco characters of each other. A lot of the movesets would be very similar. So I don't don't know. I've just Resident Evil is another franchise I don't think gets enough enough love, and the love that it does get is not tailored properly. I guess they just they tend to take an idea and stretch it out way too far. And you know, now that we're finally getting that Resident Evil Two remake, hey Capcom, how about Resident Evil Three? Oh, yes. Can we get that next? Because I haven't played Resident Evil 3 since I was in middle school. And a Nemesis was such a difficult game. game. Holy crap. It was. And, you know, just having Nemesis stalk you through the entire game, there's just something about that particular aspect of the game that really keeps you on edge. It's horrifying. Right. I mean, on top of all the other jump scares in the game, having to worry about the... I mean, and you will die. You see Nemesis but, bust through a wall. Stars. And yeah. Just, oh, just, oh, dude. I have nightmares punch. about that. It's crazy. I, that was one of the Resident Evil games that I had the hardest time finishing because I never had enough ammo. I always got killed. I had to backtrack so many times just to get stuff and then finding cartridges to save my game. Oh, dude, it's ridiculous. I did not miss ink cartridges in Resident Evil 7. <laughs> Can I just throw that out there? Oh, man. You know, and I, and I recently so replayed Resident Evil 4, and I was I was never happier than when they got rid of the whole ink cartridge to save. That was, uh, that was definitely a saving grace for that series. But, uh, you know, back to Smash, I think... Uh, my real, if I had to choose an absolute like dream big character, I would rather have this character in Smash over anybody else that's unannounced. And I hate to say this because unfortunately it's already been announced as an assist trophy. How cool would it have been? How nice would it have complimented Mega Man to have zero? Oh man, as a player, Absol- character. I and game. I don't know why they don't do that. And I and again, it's just like back to this whole Capcom thing. Capcom characters do not get the love that they deserve. Right. And we've kind of seen a renaissance of Capcom recently. Mm-hmm. And, you know, they've been, uh, they've really been treating their fans well. They did Resident Evil 7. We've got Mega Man 11 coming out in October, which I'm pumped for. As um, you should be. Just a couple of days ago, they announced they're remastering Onimusha Warlords. Hey, for uh, okay. Steam, P- uh, it's, uh, PC, PS4, Xbox One, and Switch. Wow. are all getting that. And, of course, we're getting Devil May Cry 5 this spring. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, Devil May Cry 5 launches, I want to say it's March. Is uh, is this a new storyline, or is Nero coming back? Nero is back, Dante is back. Not just any Dante, old-ass pissed-off Dante. Oh, good, Yeah, good. Old, pissed-off Dante. Like the, the I love like the over-the-top Angels versus Demons story in those games, and it fits so well. Having Nero was a much, much-needed addition to that series, and his, his attitude fits perfectly. I loved Res- or Devil May Cry 4. Great game. And, you know, yeah, I'm a big fan of that series. And, you know, Dante would be a great Smash character. He, no, would, he would be a lot of fun. Well, they're never going to get it because yeah, Capcom. <laughs> but, uh, and, you know, the best thing about these Capcom games is we're getting all of these within the next few months because, like I said, Mega Man 11 is in October. Oni Mush is in January. Resident Evil 2 is in January. Devil May Cry is in the spring. Oh, man. It's like, what? I mean, they're just... Here you go. Here's every franchise except for Dino Crisis that y'all have been asking for for the past <laughs> several years. We're just going to dump these on you all at once. Have fun. And we're just going to be like, I, I feel like I want to swim naked in the pool of Capcom games. I would point. watch. That would be cool. Can you we know? get a new DuckTales game, Capcom? Can you can you work something out with Disney and get us like DuckTales 3? My only gripe with Capcom right now is obviously um, I got the PS uh, the 
PSVR, PlayStation VR on launch. Okay. Super, super pleased with it. And I, I literally bought it for the sole reason of playing Resident Evil 7 when it launched. And I did. And it was terrifying. Horrifying game. So well done for VR. Amazing. And, you know, I didn't play the VR. I don't have oh. a PlayStation VR, so I didn't play that mode. But I love Resident Evil 7. So I think... I. Th- you know the PlayStation VR. I'm a big, I'm a VR fan. I don't want to say I'm a VR buff, but I'm a VR fan. And you know they had like the the scene in Resident Evil Seven near the beginning where you're still trying to figure out what's going on. And you find you find Zoe, and you're in the top of the stairs. And the first time you see her, all like hawked out, and you're like, "What's going on?" And you like you you open up the door and you start walking down the stairs, and it's dark. And she starts to walk up the stairs towards you. Oh yeah. I'm sitting in the I'm sitting in my living room because in the VR for the PlayStation, it's not full motion control. It's just the headset, and you can look around with that. But you're, I'm sitting in this chair, and uh, my brother was there. He could attest to this. I'm sitting there and I'm watching this, and you know I'm playing, and you know this is our first time through. We have no idea what's going on, and we're looking down the staircase, and she starts to walk up, and it's just like coming to life in my face. And I'm like, I literally like dropped the controller and I'm shaking because I'm so terrified. And then it's like, I'm like, oh God. And I like tried to turn around and run up the stairs and back out of the room. <laughs> it, it's scary. So my biggest gripe with Capcom <laughs> is the fact that, you know, I've moved on from the PlayStation VR. Um, it was a little too, the resolution wasn't too great. And I really only bought it for that reason. Sold it off, picked up a Oculus Rift for the PlayStation. The, that game came out in January of 2017, I believe, and they had a one-year exclusivity for the PlayStation for the VR on that. Correct. So they lost it at the beginning of this year in January, and neither the Oculus Rift or the Vive have uh, the HTC Vive have capitalized on getting so, that game out. So they didn't uh, update the Steam version for VR then. So there is no, there's not a VR Steam version officially. There is the only version that's out for that game is you can download the Vive X, I do believe, or Vorp X or whatever it's called, and you can play it in VR. Interesting. So they, it's not an official. There's no t- full touch motion, anything like that. So that's what's really bumming me out is like I've been waiting, and uh, I read a, uh, the other day that the um, CEO of the Oculus company had said, or I shouldn't say CEO because they're owned by Facebook, but the owner of like the head of all that whole thing said that they are just waiting for the day that Capcom gives them the approval to fully produce it because they're ready. And that would be huge for Capcom and the, um, the virtual reality so market. So from what I'm gathering really, your, your big gripe with Capcom isn't necessarily Capcom's fault. Oh no, it is. It's their fault. Okay. Gotcha. They, they're the ones that have said that you know, or I shouldn't say I've said anything. They've just been silent on the matter, and it's been a year. So, well, and I think they've had a lot of their focus has been on Resident Evil Two. But I mean, you would think it with with the technology we have right now, especially going from one VR system to another, there shouldn't really be that much of a difficulty in porting that. I can't imagine why there would be. I mean, right. it seems. And again, I'm very much appreciative that they're taking their time and efforts to putting in things like Resident Evil Two remake i'm so excited for that could not be more excited for that because i mean that's that's possible game of the year for next year that's... i agree and whenever you have a game of the year of a remake and you're going up against things like anthem you know which also yeah, looks, looks amazing like a great game and i'm not sold on it yet because I'm, I'm a little worried about what ea might do with it because we know how ea is right you know I, i'm waiting for them to open up the anthem box and take a shit at it right now yeah <laughs> you're not wrong turn it into battlefront too um, but, uh, you know, that's the thing. With, it's, did you play through the whole, the entirety of Resident Evil 7 on PlayStation VR? Yeah. Played okay, the so whole you did thing. play the whole thing. That game's a master class in horror. Oh, it's so and good. That's, and when I say that, that's unlike anything we've seen in the last probably 10 or 15 years. Don't get me wrong. You know, The Evil Within did a really great job bringing a true horror game back. But sometimes the difficulty in that game could get so frustrating. Yeah, and I, I actually felt like the difficulty level in that game was actually, it was more gimmicky than it was just hard. Right, it's not like when you're playing Dark Souls, when it's supposed to be difficult and it plays into what you're doing in the game. Exactly. It was just hard, and that, that to me is what tends to turn me off from a game. Yep, I agree. Is when it's, it's hard just for the sake of being hard, and it's not for intended progression of the game or learning from your mistakes yeah and that was my huge gripe and i never played two so and i didn't either so like in in one you start out and what's the you can only run for like three seconds without your character getting winded yeah, what it's, is that it's, it's ridiculous. i'm a fat guy and i can run for at least a few minutes without getting winded i mean come on that guy was in shape he had a six pack 
Like, come yeah, on. I mean, he was the most shredded detective. Yeah, absolutely. I've ever seen. <laughs> other I mean, than Batman, of course. Other than Batman, and other than uh, than Terry from Brooklyn Nine Nine. <laughs> Jesus, <laughs> because you know he's uh he's ripped. Yeah, but uh, you know one of the game I want to talk about today, um, before we uh, take off for the evening, and I know we're going to touch on this again here coming up in episode one, Red Dead Redemption Two. Oh man, this is rock star thing. So this is where you and I are going to defer. I I am a rock star anti fanatic. So like, you you don't uh, you don't like Rockstar games typically. So I've never played Red Dead Redemption. Okay. So and I, this is you know I'll be the first to admit that this is a completely biased opinion based off of that. Right. Um. I guess I should say, yeah, it's it's negative bias. <laughs> um. But my I don't I never liked the idea of Grand Theft Auto because I it felt cheap to me. Mm-hmm. I I'm felt, not a big Grand Theft Auto fan. Right. And that, and that's the uh, the idea of that whole like gameplay. So I guess this is more of me taking out my hatred for Grand Theft Auto and on Red Dead. Mm-hmm. But I like games with like a, a super defined path. Um, so which, you're not you like more more of a linear type game as opposed to an open world. I, I like choices. Don't get me wrong. Okay. Like I was a huge Breath of the Wild fan. Um, but that could just be my love for Zelda bleeding in. And I won't lie, I was skeptical about Breath of the Wild when it came out. But Red Dead Redemption. I didn't give it a chance for one, but it's. I think the reason for that is because I'm I'm blaming Grand Theft Auto. Now I'm not a big Grand Theft Auto fan. That being said, Red Dead Redemption is a lot of fun because you don't get a lot of Western games. See, that's another thing. I'm not a Western fan, and I'm typically not either. But Red Dead Redemption, the first one, was a pretty fun game. And when I watched the the gameplay reveal for Red Dead Redemption Two a few weeks ago. Um, they seem to do it a lot with there's a bullet time type element. Like think of uh, the old Max Payne games. Right. Yep. And it just you know it looks like it's gonna be a lot of fun. Good. And well, uh, I know my brother uh, lives in Virginia. He is a him and his friends not not big Western fans anything like that. He tried to get me to play and I obviously declined. But he they were huge into it. They would all get together and all play where a dead redemption. So they're all very excited about it. So I could I could see myself giving it a chance and maybe now once two comes out I might be able to grab number one for ten bucks. Yeah, it's on Xbox you can get it on the Xbox marketplace actually. I think it's maybe fifteen dollars for the game of the year edition with the zombies expansion. I mean, if it's that good of a game, I've heard many people tell every I mean it's probably worth it's a good thirty dollar game still. Absolutely. So um one last game to talk about here before we go. I don't know I already said that but it's okay. fine. We didn't get we're we didn't gurus, really get man. Much we keep into, going. We didn't get much into Red Dead, but this is a game that I personally, aside from Smash, this is my most highly anticipated game for the rest of the year. No, believe it or not, it's not Fallout seventy six because I'm a huge Fallout fan. Let me get it. Let me have it. Marvel's Spider Man. Oh, on dude. the PlayStation Four. Okay, so we're we're just a little bit over a week out from the launch. So, Spider Man is literally the reason my PlayStation Four still is in this house. I have no other reason for having it. Months ago, I was like, I haven't played this thing in months. You I bought mean, it for Bloodborne, correct? Correct. And I that's did. a great choice because Bloodborne's a fantastic game. It is. I've I have countless. This is, this countless is coming hours from somebody who's not a huge fan of the Souls games. I love Bloodborne. Oh, it's it's amazing. But uh, so Spider Man. Whenever I saw it was coming out for the PlayStation Four, I I had literally been planning to sell my PlayStation. I had a guy at work that was going to buy it off of me. Did you not play God of War? I'm not a God of War fan. Okay. Even if you're not a God of War fan, you are denying yourself the opportunity to play one of the greatest games I've heard of the last 10 years many good things. I'm, just, I'm not a hack and slash person, okay, so the, the original ones didn't do it for me. I really enjoyed the quick time events of what I played of 3, mm-hmm. which was was very well done. I would I know I would like uh, God of War. Uh, I think it's just called God of War, it's just right? Called, it's got a much deeper combat and progression system. And that's fine. Because it, it looked to me like they took um, they took a third-person approach to, like, Batman almost and then put it in, like, the God of War world. I think the best way probably to describe the new God of War game is if you take what God of War used to be and kind of turn it into a God of War Witcher 3 that's, light. That's what I was trying to think of was Which, Witcher. by the way, Witcher 3 is another amazing game. Yeah, I think you could probably have a whole episode on we, Witcher. We totally could. And I think if, when we, if we ever do that, Justin has to be here because he could talk about The Witcher 3 for hours. Yep. But and I haven't beat the game, so. it's, it's real. I haven't personally beat it either, but my roommate actually played... I want to say, like, in a week, put 100 hours into it. Like that's, he, It's not hard to do. Yeah, he was... I did that with Fallout 3. Oh, <laughs> so good. Um... 
but the back to Spider-Man, I, it was, I think this was like in March and I was like, well, guess I'm hanging on to this thing. So my PlayStation four has been cleaned off, primed off, ready to go for Spider-Man. It's already pre-ordered, paid for. I'm ready to play this thing. You know, here's the thing with superheroes. I love superheroes. I'm typically lean a little more toward DC, uh, even though their movies are generally terrible. Um, (laughs) Make but cry. I, I have a soft spot for Spider-Man. I he, think everyone does. I, Spider-Man is just a fun hero that really anybody can relate to because he's he's a normal guy, yep. and he's a nerd. He's he's us. Yeah, he's but us he with gets powers. Some cool, sp- uh, cool spider powers. And you know, it, with Insomniac Games developing this game, and here's the thing: we know they can make a superhero style game because they made uh, there was an Xbox One title. Um, I'm trying to remember what the game was called. It was an exclusive uh, Sunset Overdrive. Oh, that yeah. That they made a few years okay. ago. Uh, you know. What a I, soiree into gaming, man. That yeah. was crazy. So when I, after playing Sunset Overdrive, when I saw they were doing the new Spider-Man game, I said, you know what? This is right up the rally way. Because the only other game they've released recently was the Ratchet and Clank remake, which was also great. But this is a company that knows how to make amazing games. Insomniac always delivers. Yep, and I agree. to give them an IP like Spider Man and just letting them run with it, and yeah. they're even tying the game over into comic book canon. There's a novel available right now, not a visual novel; it's an actual novel uh, that basically serves as an introduction to the new game. And uh, Insomniac's Spider Man is joining the uh, Spider Verse in Marvel Comics in September. Oh wow! So they're Man. you know Marvel's really jumping all out on this. Yeah, absolutely. And I know. You, if you haven't seen gameplay of this game, it looks spectacular. It looks like they took, I mean, obviously, what if we're hearkening back to Spider-Man games as a whole, you know, obviously the best Spider-Man game that's ever existed, Spider-Man 2. Oh, hands first, down. Yeah, absolutely. Hands down. And the really, I think, I, you know, and I could be wrong in stating this, the thing that sold that game was the webs, the web slinging and the movement in that game. Because, you know, you had Spider-Man 1, you know the the story. The it was fun combat. But can like, we shout it, out to uh, Spider Man on PlayStation One? Just want to shout out there for oh the, yeah the, the original plain Spider Man yeah. on PS One <laughs> that was kind of based on the uh, the TV cartoon, but kind of based on the comic. That was very fun though. It's great game, but it, it anyways, had classic fights, everything. Yeah. yeah, I agree. I'm a I'm completely okay with that shout out. But the thing that really sold me on Spider Man Two was you know I went from one. I played one. Was a really big fan of it because you know. I'm young. It's a Spider-Man game. I'm really loving it. But then like now that I'm, you know, Spider-Man two came out, it, it called out the fact that like when you're moving around the city, where are his webs hitting? Like they're just sticking in the sky and they're not hitting anything and you're just moving. And then Spider-Man two, you get this, like you can see they're latched to the side of the building and you're like curving around buildings and plays to the realism that shouldn't exist because it's a superhero game, but it's a lot more realistic. Yeah. And that's, and Spider, the new Spider-Man game really captures that, and obviously the with the enhanced graphics of what the PS4 is capable of, and just the story that they've led into with the intro scenes and, and the all trailers. The villains. Oh man, all the and they're villains. just beating the crap out of him, which actually kind of harkens to you know, hopefully Spider-Man doesn't die in this because he definitely Peter Parker definitely dies in the comics that way. He gets the ever living shit kicked and out of him by all the villains here's at the thing. once. They've, they've already alluded to it. Miles Morales is in that game. Oh man! So Peter Parker know, might die in this game. Is everyone, Peter Parker going to die? <laughs> are we going to play as Miles as Spider Man, or you know, are we playing Peter Parker in the whole game? Is Miles going to be playable at all? This it's just so intriguing. And I've gone silent on this game. I haven't watched a trailer since E three. I don't want to see anything else. I'm I in the just, same boat I want as to you. Experience this game when it's in my hands. In about nine days from when we record this, that's I'm, that's where I'm at with this game. I don't want to see anything else. And every time the TV, the commercial comes on TV, I kind of look away. You know, <laughs> but it like, just looks so good. But it looks so good. It's I'm, a beautiful game. I'm ready for this game, and this will be another one where you know I haven't played a good a good Spider-Man game in a long time. A long time since well, I haven't made a good Spider-Man, Spider-Man game in too. a long time. Absolutely, and it, it's like. Spider-Man 2 was like the end of good movie games. After mm-hmm. that, they just became monotonous garbage that were money grabs. Well, and really, the only other good Spider-Man game that's come out since Spider-Man 2, and a lot of people like Ultimate Spider-Man. And it's it's fine. But, you know, they did release Spider-Man, I think it was called Shattered Dimensions, hmm. a few years ago on the Xbox 360. That and sounds PlayStation really 3, familiar. Where you played as four different versions of Spider-Man throughout the campaign. You okay, played as Ultimate, I know what you're talking about. Amazing, Noir, and 2099. 
Gotcha. And each Spider-Man handled completely differently and had their own story going on and then eventually tied all together. Well, that's awesome. Yeah. I might need to try that out. And, you know, and even Deadpool was in the game as a villain. And there was a whole level based around fighting Deadpool. Good. So, uh, Deadpool games suck. Dead, Deadpool game. The, the Deadpool game <laughs> was uh, not a great endeavor, <laughs> unfortunately. And that's coming from a fan of Deadpool. And it just wasn't that great of a game. Yeah. I mean, Nolan North tried. He, at least he was he was fun as Deadpool in the game. But uh, aside from that, didn't do so hot. Yeah. And it, I mean, they, they're really, like I said, it was a cash grab. You know, they're like, hey, Deadpool's popular right now. Let's put out, you know, this half ass Deadpool game. And that's a it don't get me wrong, that's a game that's gonna be hard to do because you're <laughs> taking a a character that breaks the fourth wall so commonly and sticking him inside of yet another wall that they have to break. Exactly. So it's it's a that's a tough one to do. But you know, that it that is, it is what it is. I'm very excited for it. I'm really excited to get to talk about it again on the show, regardless of when my next rotation as a panelist will be. I am excited to hear what you guys think of it. Oh, absolutely. And I'm sure when we, uh, when we dive into our first, I mean, this, this is episode one half. I'm sure when we dive into episode one here in a couple of weeks from the day when we go to record that, I'm sure Spider-Man is going to come up because I would be one. I mean, I know at least I'm going to be playing it. I will definitely be playing and, it. And uh, if, you, if you join us on that, I'm sure we can talk about it a little bit before we get into uh, talking about the rest of the games of 2018, which will be our main topic of that episode. Going to have to charge up that PlayStation 4 controller. It's been a long time. Get I that mean, blue light shining. The last shining. PlayStation game I bought was Detroit, and I think I played it for an hour. So it, it's uh, it, my my PlayStation Four is starving for attention that it hasn't gotten since I beat God of War. Yep. All right. So this has been episode one half of the Gurus of Gaming podcast. Again, my name is Roger Harper. I'm the moderator. And, and I am, to, uh, go ahead. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt. There. I'm Michael, and I am one of the rotating panelists on the show. And I have had an absolute blast being here. So before we go, let's talk just a little bit about uh, ways you can support our podcast and 13 Palm Trees in general. Uh, First of all, you can find Gurus of Gaming podcast on Facebook at Gurus of Gaming. I highly suggest go to our Facebook page, give us a like. Anytime I'm going to be uh, streaming a game on Twitch, I always post it up there. There's a link to our Twitch channel. And if you'd like to see us bring more content, I would love to be able to stream PlayStation 4, to stream Nintendo Switch, to play some classic Nintendo games, Super Nintendo, old school stuff live for any of our listeners on Twitch. But in order for us to get the equipment to be able to do this, we need support. So you can check us out at patreon.com slash gurus of gaming. Even just a dollar a month helps to pay our bills, helps pay for our bandwidth to keep our shows online. Uh, You'll be able to check us out on iTunes and other choices of podcasts. You can find gurus of gaming upon launch at, or now, you can find gurus of gaming now. Right now, that? because this is uh, this is going to be on iTunes. Yeah, you can find us on iTunes, Google Podcasts, Podbean, Castbox, Stitcher. I mean, Spotify. Once we have the bandwidth to be on Spotify, because they're weird like that. Do we have any sound uh, any SoundCloud fans out there? So SoundCloud, we could get on SoundCloud if we want to. I mean, SoundCloud's unique. It's a unique market, but we'll make sure that we have a avenue for you to hear what we have going for us bottom so. line you've got a lot of ways you can check us out and listen to our episodes i uh, also suggest checking out 13 palm trees podcast productions on facebook they also have an official web page 13 palm trees.com yep and if you actually go to any of any major podcasting app and instead of actually searching for gurus of gaming if you're having trouble finding it there you can actually just search for 13 palm trees and gurus of gaming will populate there for you Leave us a like, leave us a subscribe, leave us a review. All those things help us with discoverability. And while you're there, check out some of the other podcasts that 13 Palm Trees has under its its banner. There is not a bad podcast under that banner. If you're a West Virginian, definitely check out Wasted Local Talent. Uh, Daniel and Jed highlight local businesses and musicians and pretty much anything local on that podcast. It's a great show. It's a, it's a great to get some exposure for that. Um, and I don't want to talk too much about any of the other shows, but I know Wasted Local Talent is very near and dear to my heart. We recently attended the West Virginia Pop Con uh, in order to get a little bit of extra exposure, and we had actually three of the booths there say that people had bought stuff or had came up to talk to them because they heard about some of the stuff via the show. That is a huge win for us. Absolutely. That's the whole point Absolutely. of what we're doing is to get exposure for local bands, local businesses. If you're a fan of tabletop gaming, we've got D&D Conda. If you're a fan of video games, check out Video Game Mythos. It's a little different from this show. We don't actually do any kind of paneling or anything. We just take you to the hardline facts, theories, and all the other weird stuff we can find on the internet regarding video game characters. 
So, and also check out Hype and Cow. We've got some sweet comic books, pop culture, which all, all these things intertwine, intertwine really, really well. So, great. Hey, thanks, uh, thanks, Michael, for for coming on with me today. Absolutely, and, thanks for having uh, me. We'll be back with the official episode one here in just a couple of weeks. Thanks for listening. Mm-hmm.